Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote the famous American novel, The Scarlet Letter. And in that story, if you don't know it, the unmarried Hester Prynne gives birth to a daughter named Pearl. And this took place in colonial Boston. In the story, Pren is punished by being publicly shamed by her community and forced to wear a scarlet A for the rest of her life, which symbolizes that she is an adulteress. Pren never tells who the father of her child is, though, and the shock in the story is that the father of her child is the local minister who never confesses until his guilt overwhelms him and he eventually dies with a deathbed confession. Countless Americans have read this novel in high school and it's generally interpreted today as a devastating critique of Christian hypocrisy. What this story shows, many modern people think, is that a biblical sexual ethic is judgmental, patriarchal, and above all, above all, hypocritical. Now, I should mention that I talked to one of our members, Kyle Yonke, this week, who convincingly explained to me that that is not the right way to understand the Scarlet Letter. And it's actually a powerful story of redemption, accountability for wrong, and other things as well. So if you would like to know how to actually interpret the Scarlet Letter, Kyle teaches books like this for a living, and you can talk to him about it. But what I'm talking about this morning is how it is interpreted, albeit wrongly, in our culture. So is that true? Is it true that a biblical sexual ethic is puritanical, judgmental, self-righteous, and deserves to be discarded by modern people like us. I'm raising this question because whether we like it or not, I'm preaching Genesis 38 this morning, which is a tough, tough story for modern readers like us. It's foreign and graphic, and again, whether we like it or not, the main subject of this story is sex. So let's remember something very important that we believe about the Bible. God the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to write Genesis 38. Let's let that sink in. God put this in the Bible for us. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11 says, that the Old Testament was written down for our instruction. And 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all Scripture, including Genesis 38, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Genesis 38 is in the Bible because we need it. And just like a lot of things in life, we sometimes need the uncomfortable things the most. So my sermon passage, obviously by this point, is Genesis 38, verses 1 through 30. And so I would invite you to turn there in your copy of the Bible. Genesis 38, verses 1 through 30. And if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, I would invite you to use one of the black covered pew Bibles. And you can find Genesis 38 beginning on on page 32. That's page 32. Now, if you're newer here, you might be asking a very fair question. You might be thinking, okay, I understand that Genesis 38 is in the Bible, but why today? There are a lot of other chapters in the Bible too. So why'd you pick to preach on it today? And the reason why is that this is the 37th sermon in a preaching series through Genesis, and this was the next passage. So that's why we're preaching it today. We're currently in the third and final section of Genesis, which focuses on the story of Joseph. But our passage this week, surprisingly, doesn't feature Joseph, but it focuses on one of his brothers, Judah. 
Genesis is the true story of how God blesses sinners like you and me living in a sin-cursed world like this one. And we're going to see that in Genesis 38. So will you stand for the reading of the Word of God and follow along with me as I read Genesis 38, beginning in verse 1. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Chezeb when she bore him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers, he and his friends Hira, the Adulamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, She took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and set at the entrance to Anayim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, if you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, what pledge shall I give you? She replied, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. And he asked the men of this place, Where is the cult prostitute who was at Anayim at the roadside? And they said, No cult prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also the men of the place said, No cult prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, Let her keep the things as her own, or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat, and you did not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please identify who these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Sheila, and he did not know her again. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out, and she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. You may be seated. This is another one of those stories in Genesis, not the first, that makes us think, that is in the Bible. Well, it is. 
And while this story is shocking and uncomfortable in many ways, it actually has three ways to instruct normal, everyday followers of Jesus like you and me. And so I want to show you three things that this passage teaches us about. The first is sex, the second is hypocrisy, and the third, praise the Lord, is grace. So first, sex. L.P. Hartley famously said, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Sometimes historical context is optional for understanding a biblical story. This is not one of those times. As the story tells you in verses 3 and 7, if you still have your Bibles open, Ur was Judah's firstborn, but he died without leaving any children. In the ancient world, this was a disaster. The firstborn son was expected to be the heir and carry on the hopes of the family. So Judah commanded Onan his second oldest son, to impregnate Tamar on his brother's behalf. Look at verse 8. Judah said, go, Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law and raise up offspring for your brother. This ancient practice is called leveret marriage. And as strange as it may seem to us, it was very common in the ancient world. It was socially acceptable And more importantly, God himself actually put this practice in the Old Testament law. Listen to Deuteronomy 25, 5-6. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears, shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out in Israel. You see, this is not some strange practice related to sexual pleasure. It was a way for families to survive in the ancient world, where offspring mattered most. And if I asked you what the most romantic book in the Bible is, what would you say? I want to hear an answer. Song of Solomon, that's a good answer. What would be your next answer? Ruth. That's exactly right. And did you know that Ruth is based on this practice? The whole book of Ruth is based on leveret marriage. Because Boaz, who redeems Ruth, was a relative of her deceased husband, which is why he was able to marry Ruth in the first place. So when Boaz finalizes his redemption of Ruth, he publicly says in Ruth 4.10 that he did it to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. We rightly understand the book of Ruth to be a story of sacrificial family loyalty, which is even romantic in its own way. And the book of Ruth is based on the practice of leveret marriage. Leveret marriage is also the background for how the Pharisees questioned Jesus in Matthew 22. Ben read it earlier in the service, and the Pharisees presented Jesus with a hypothetical scenario where one woman married seven successive brothers because each of them died without children. This practice is behind that question. So enter Onan. Moses tells us exactly what we need to know about what Onan did in verse 9. Nothing more and nothing less, and so I won't describe it anymore. But look at verse 9, because it explains what motivated Onan. And this is what we need to see. We need to see his motivation. Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. Onan selfishly didn't want his brother to have any offspring that could continue as the firstborn in the family. Onan wanted that place for himself and his offspring, so he came up with a scheme to undermine his dead brother and hypocritically disobey 
the wishes of his father. But here's the catch for Onan. Onan knew that not doing his responsibility would have come with public shame. I read from Deuteronomy 25, 5-6 earlier. Listen to verses 7-10. through 10. And if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, like Onan, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of his city will call him and speak to him. They'll try to reason with him. And if he persists, saying, I do not wish to take her, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall answer and say, So shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And the name of his house shall be called in Israel the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. You see, a brother-in-law who failed to do what Judah asked Onan to do would be publicly shamed by his community. Onan didn't want to do what was right, and he didn't want the consequences that would come with doing what was wrong, so he came up with what he thought was a solution. God disagreed, and God executed Onan for his sin. Now by this point, let's get back to Judah. Judah is facing an absolute, unmitigated family disaster. His two oldest sons are dead. No children from either one. But, as is so often in life, it's not what happened, no matter how bad it is, but it's how we respond. And that's where Judah's actions start to drive this story. Judah responds out of superstitious fear, and he wrongs Tamar and sins against his whole family in the process. Look at verse 11. Judah said to Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. The rest of the story shows that Judah never intended to keep that promise. Verse 11 goes on, For he feared that he would die like his brothers. Maybe Judah... Seriously, thought that Tamar was cursed in some way. And if he married his third and final son to Tamar, which would have been the right thing to do, he would have died too. Or maybe, like many parents today, Judah was blinded to the sin of his own children and blamed his daughter-in-law instead. That's a story as old as Genesis 38. But for whatever reason, Judah was blinded by fear from doing the right thing. Over time, Tamar realized that Judah would never keep his word. Look at verse 14. For she saw that Shelah was grown up, and she had not been given to him in marriage. So Tamar set a trap for Judah. Tamar heard that Judah was taking a business trip, So she dressed herself like a prostitute and waited for him to pass by. And when he did, he solicited her. And Tamar agreed based on one condition. That Judah would give her, verse 18, his signet, cord, and staff. These items were like the equivalent of handing over your driver's license in the ancient world. And then Judah unknowingly slept with his daughter-in-law, Tamar. A biblically faithful church must face sexual sin. No matter how inconvenient, uncomfortable, and painful it is. And one of the reasons why is that the Bible addresses it repeatedly and unapologetically. And I think part of the reason why is because God knows how common it is in our world. In this story, Onan selfishly abused his sexual relationship with Tamar. Judah solicited a prostitute who he didn't know was Tamar, and the whole time Tamar was sexually manipulating Judah. One of the reasons that we have to talk about things like this as a church is because what we say about it provides the truthful counter-programming 
to the lies of the world. If the church never addresses passages like this, we create a vacuum where the world addresses it for us instead. And in Genesis 38, the Bible gives us that counter-programming. It deconstructs two of the most common myths about sex in our culture. And I'll tell you what they are. The first is that sexual behavior is a purely private matter. Many people today ask what business anyone, God included, but especially other people, what business does anyone have telling you what you do in your private life? Whenever you hear people say, like, say things like that, remember, own it. No one knew, except Onan and probably Tamar. But God knew. Onan probably thought that he would never be accountable, but God knew. Onan probably justified his actions in his own mind and believed that he was doing what was best for him and his family, which made whatever he did with Tamar right. But he was wrong, and God knew. What our culture doesn't understand is that in God's world, there are no purely private sexual choices. God has an opinion. And He tells us what to think and asks us as His people to tell the truth to the world. A second common myth about sex in our culture that this story deconstructs is that no one is harmed when they live by their own sexual ethic. You've heard this. Many people ask, why would the church, why would the Bible, why would God have an opinion about things where no one gets hurt? But look at the story. Onan wrongs Tamar. Tamar wrongs Judah. And then Judah is nearly burned wrongly for a crime which Judah was an equal perpetrator in. In this story, people very much get hurt. I have often heard non-Christians complain that the God of the Bible cares too much about sex, which I've always thought is ridiculous because our culture is obsessed with it. But assuming that question is coming from a good place, an earnest objection, one of the answers to that question of why God cares about our private sexual choices is because when we disregard his definition of right and wrong, people get hurt. People get hurt. One day, Lord willing, I will have the privilege and joy and punishment of teaching my daughters how to drive. And when I get to teach them that, I imagine that I am going to be giving some pretty specific instructions. I might even be a little intense when I do. But imagine that one of my daughters decided that she was going to ignore what I said and was going to drive the car in the way that she thought was right. Would I just sit there and allow her to express herself? No. I would correct her, and if she refused to listen to that, I would have to take the privilege of driving away from her and it's not because I would be a selfishly controlling parent, like many people imagine God, but it would be because she's going to kill herself and probably some other people too, if she doesn't listen to what I say. And that's why God gives us instructions about sex. Our culture rebels against it. Our culture doesn't want it. But whether we like it or not, when it's misused, people get hurt. And you see that in Genesis 38. Now, this story teaches us even more than that, but we need to move on. Because this story doesn't just teach us something about sex, it also teaches us something about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Look at verse 24. Verse 24 says that about three months after Judah unknowingly slept with Tamar, he discovered that she was pregnant. So he condemned her to death by burning so Tamar, and you have to love this. So Tamar in verse 25 sent Judah his signet, cord, and staff and said they belonged to the father of her baby. Verse 26 
if you look at it, shows that the truth hit Judah like a ton of bricks. Judah says, she is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Sheila. Imagine that you were on duty as a law enforcement officer and a 911 call came in where a small business owner was saying that one of his employees was stealing from the cash register of his business. So you go to check it out, and when you arrive, the business owner points out the person who is guilty, but the employee confesses. Yes, I was taking money out of the cash register. But then the employee goes on to say, I was taking money out of the cash register because my boss has withheld my wages for three months. And I didn't even take out everything that I was owed. I'm not a legal scholar. I don't know how that's going to play out, but that would sure change my understanding of that situation. And that's what Judah was able to realize in this passage. Judah realized that his sin had pushed Tamar to do what she did. Tamar was wronged by Onan, then she was wronged by Judah, so she took matters into her own hands. The point of this story is not that what Tamar did was right. It was obviously wrong. The point of this story is that Judah was an equal participant in the sin that he had condemned Tamar for. If Judah was going to burn Tamar, he was going to have to light himself on fire first. That's what Judah realized. And you know, hypocrisy, like the hypocrisy that we see in Judah, is an ever-present danger in our hearts individually and in the life of the church. Over the past week or so, we've all experienced bitter cold, and we all know that if we stop heating our homes for a moment, if we open a single door or window at merely a crack, the cold immediately starts to creep in. And hypocrisy is like that in the church. More ever-present than the cold, more bitter. And if we don't guard against hypocrisy every moment in our lives and in our church, it will start to creep in. And it'll happen before we even know that it's there. But there is good news in this story There's good news for hypocrites like us. Judah, as wrong as he was, and he was so wrong, Judah did one thing right. Judah admitted his own hypocrisy. He changed direction, and he did what he could to make things right. Judah could have tried to cover up his sin in some way, but he didn't add sin to sin. And as verse 26 shows, Judah treated Tamar more justly moving forward. He treated her like a member of his household. And also, much later in the story of Genesis, we will see that Judah took responsibility for her twin sons, and he treated them like they were his rightful heirs and legitimate children. Judah was responsible for creating a terrible situation, and he couldn't change that. Judah had failed as a father, he had failed as a father-in-law, most profoundly he had failed as a man, but even though Judah couldn't change the past, he could own up, he could admit where he was wrong, he could do better in the future. Now don't mishear me, admitting our mistakes does not immunize us from the consequences That sure wasn't true for Judah, but it's a sign. It's a sign of gospel repentance. That the Holy Spirit is working in our hearts to let us grow. A godly husband, a godly father, a godly man is not one who never makes mistakes, but one who can own up to his double standards. One who can admit his hypocrisy when it's exposed. One who doesn't add sin to sin, but does what's right. So this story teaches us something about sex. It teaches us something about hypocrisy. But praise the Lord. It also teaches us something about grace. 
It teaches us something about grace. In this story, we see two marks. Two marks of grace. And here's the first. One is that Judah starts to change. That's the first mark of grace. Do you remember who Judah is? Judah participated in the conspiracy against Joseph and helped his brothers sell him into slavery. Then, Judah made some very questionable decisions before he ever did what he did with Tamar. He married a Canaanite. He was living away from his family. And then eventually, he wronged Tamar by lying to her, neglecting his duty as a father, and he went on to solicit a prostitute who he didn't know was his own daughter-in-law. But God showed him grace. God showed Judah grace. God humbled him. God exposed his hypocrisy. And Judah started to permanently change. By the way, I can't talk about this this morning, but you might wonder why is there this story, this story of all stories, in the story of Joseph. The reason why is because Judah, at the end of the book of Genesis, is a changed man. And this story is here in Genesis 38 to show you where his change started to happen. So that's the first mark of grace. One of the greatest gifts that God gives sinners like us is hope for change. We don't have to live in the same sin by the same double standards and the same selfishness. We can grow by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the second mark of grace in this story is that against all odds, God did the impossible. And he used what happened between Judah and Tamar in his plan of redemption. I wonder, would you be surprised to learn that Tamar is one of four women in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1? I don't know how you handle shameful things in your family. We're all tempted to suppress them, try to pretend that they're not there and hope they go away. But in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, there is Tamar. And the reason why is because none other than the Lord Jesus Christ was descended from Perez, one of the twin boys that Tamar gave birth to. Eventually, Perez would be an ancestor of King David. Ultimately, he would be the ancestor of the lion of the tribe of Judah. And what this shows all of us is that there is a place for sexual sinners in the family of God. There is a place for hypocrites in the family of God. No level of brokenness can stop God from saving us, stop Him from changing us, or prevent Him from using us in His plan of redemption. Think about Tamar. What would have been best for her? Would it have been better for Tamar to have an uneventfully happy life with many children, with a loving husband? Or was it better for her to have the tragically broken life that she had, but be used as part of God's plan to save the world? Today I'm preaching about Tamar because of what was done to her and how God used her anyway. And in eternity, we will tell this story. Because it shows how God can save. Only God knows how He will use our mistreatments, the way others have wronged us and sinned against us for His glory. Only God knows that. But this story shows that He can and that He will. Aren't you glad that in a story like this, full of sexual sin and hypocrisy, there is grace? Grace for people like you and me. And you know, I hope you know, that none of us can proudly stand over these biblical characters in judgment because all of us join them in their sin. Maybe our sin isn't as dramatic or socially unacceptable as what's described in these stories. 
but we all fall short of His standard. We knowingly or unknowingly impose double standards on other people and judge them for the same sins that we commit. But there is grace for any of us through Tamar's great, 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 great grandson, the Lord Jesus Christ. He died so that Tamar, Judah, and every other sexual sinner and hypocrite could be forgiven freely by faith in Him. So what I'll ask you to do, my fellow sinners, is humble yourself for the first time or afresh. Humble yourself in faith. Humble yourself in repentance. See the Holy Spirit start to change you. And by God's grace, by God's grace, let's work to be a church that models His grace, not hypocrisy, to the world. Let's pray. We sang before I preached, Father, and you know it. Speak, O Lord. We ask now that you would use this story, which is uncomfortable and foreign to us, to speak to us. Show us the grace of Jesus Christ in all its glory. And we ask that you will humble us and deliver us from evil. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.